uh, a great pleasure for me to be able to introduce Andrew Light, the, tonight's speaker. Andrew's from Atlanta. He uh, received a BA from Mercer University, um, something our students will uh, sort of resonate with. He's a triple major in history, political science, and, and philosophy. Um, uh, he received his master's degree and PhD in philosophy from, philosophy from UC Riverside and uh, has taught at a number of places, uh, quite a few places for such a young man. Uh, University of Montana, SUNY Binghamton, New York University, uh, the University of Washington, and most recently he is now at uh, uh, George Mason University where he is an associate professor of philosophy and environmental policy and also the director of the Center for Global Ethics, uh, uh, an ethics program sort of like Society and the Professions, in, in, at least in the sense that it's a, a one-man show. It's not, <laughs> it, um, I think they, uh, they have better access to, to happening events, though, being close to D.C. and plugged into, the, into that culture. Um, Andrew works in environmental ethics and policy and in the ethics of emerging technologies. Uh, we had a really interesting uh, little workshop on nanotechnology um, yesterday. You can ask him about nanotechnology at the break uh, or at the reception. Um, Andrew has two books, uh, a book that's just out, I mean, pretty recently out, right, uh, called Environmental Values, and, and that's written with John O'Neill and Alan Holland. And then uh, another book that was published in 2003, Real Arguments, Film, Philosophy, and Social Criticism. And it's a cutesy title because it's Real Arguments, R-E-E-L, not R-E-A-L. Um, he's the editor of numerous other books, the author of numerous papers, book chapters, all of this way too numerous to, uh, to mention. It's quite impressive. Um, he's been the advisor to, or is currently the advisor to various agencies on the ethical dimensions of environmental policy and technology, including the U.S. Forest Service, the National Park Service, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Administra uh, Atmospheric Administration, the National Science Foundation. Um, all of this very impressive, very impressive record. Um, but uh, Andrew merits our congratulations on, on two other fronts. He uh, was just married this last summer, and he's going to be a daddy in May. So congratulations on those. Okay, so let me, uh, without further ado, um, ask you to welcome Andrew Light. Oh, I think it's recording. <laughs> um, Check. Is this too loud, or is it's weird echo, isn't it? Something's going on. Is there anyone who can? It might be that we can turn off one of these mics. Better. Is that better? It sounds sounds bizarre. I think I'm gonna get rid of this one. How's that? Is that is that working? Is that working? Okay, good. All right, let's just do that. All right. Um, thanks very much, uh, Greg, and to Angie, my uh, former colleague from the University of Washington, Angie Smith, for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, as I was getting ready to come here, I was thinking um, I just had a conversation with um, a really close friend of mine, uh, Woody Holton, who is an incredibly distinguished historian at the University of Richmond. And Woody and I um, cut our teeth doing environmental uh, work uh, when we were both in graduate school, uh, political environmental work. Um, and uh, Woody's father uh, is my favorite Virginia politician of all time, uh, Linwood Holton, who some of you may remember as being the first Republican governor after Reconstruction, um, broke the back of the Democratic Party machine um, single-handedly integrated the Richmond school system with his own children by sending his, his white children to, to black public schools in Richmond, um, was a champion of civil rights, um, was a forthright uh, Republican endorser of Barack Obama, uh, 
in Virginia and actively campaigned for Obama and is an alum of Washington and Lee. Um, and I was thinking about that because Woody was telling me, no matter what your view is on the politics of the election, I think we can all agree this is a game changer, historic, and absolutely incredible. And he was telling me about how, how amazingly happy his father was. And so I was just thinking about all of the amazing things. We can think about the history of this place that's changed you know, in the last week, um, uh, including uh, Woody Holton and, 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 uh, and lots of other folks who have been, been really working for a long time on these issues. So even though this has nothing to do with the title of my talk tonight, uh, it, it is one of those things that uh, it partly is why, uh, even though I'm going to talk about one of the gravest challenges I think that we have ever faced and the difficulties involved in dealing with it, um, just another reason to feel incredibly hopeful about what people can do uh, when they set their minds to something. Um, so the, the talk is called Climate Ethics After Bali, and it is intended um, to the, the title refers to really kind of two things. Um, if you follow, like I do, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change talks over the years, which is the, 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 the framework convention that created the Kyoto Protocol, right, which is currently the only international agreement on, on curbing greenhouse gas emissions and doing something internationally on climate change, uh, then you may know that last December, there was a very, very important meeting held in Bali, Indonesia, the last UNFCCC meeting. Um, and it was at that meeting where um, the, the so-called Bali roadmap document was, first, was, was, was put together. The roadmap to what? The roadmap to the successor to the Kyoto Protocol, which will be settled next year in 2009, in December, in Copenhagen, so the, what will become known as the Copenhagen Agreement, um, which is really our chance after, I think, getting a lot of stuff wrong on the Kyoto Protocol and the United States consistently dragging its feet on helping to do anything to move forward with an international agreement on climate change, um, uh, will once again join this conversation. Uh, so it'll be an incredibly important meeting. So the after Bali refers on the, on the one hand to that, to what is the state of, of, of what we can be doing with respect to ethics and climate change after the Bali meeting and then looking forward to the Copenhagen meeting. And then secondly, refers to my own kind of personal journey on this particular issue. So a number of years ago, for a long time, I've been advocated, advocating a position which I call environmental pragmatism and it's sort of the gist of it is that environmental ethicists have developed a lot of very, very interesting debates and value theory, but not much that really helps to practically advance a sort of a more morally responsible set of environmental policies or international environmental agreements such as the Kyoto process. Um, and it's one of those things where, you know, I was writing these long, tortured articles, right, about how we should not be writing long, tortured articles um, in philosophy, but really be doing more practical work, which of course I did because I wanted to get tenure, you know, and so I had to write these kinds of, kinds of things. Um, and, and, and when I started thinking that I wanted to really start turning to climate change um, after working on other issues in environmental philosophy, especially restoration ecology, which is the, rest, the recreation of ecosystems that don't exist anymore, and other issues in biodiversity and conservation, kind of similar kind of thing that Greg has worked in from the side of philosophy ecology. Um, so I turned to climate change, and I had made a decision that really here was I was going to put, you know, my my money where my mouth was to really try to in, in, engage with this topic in a way different uh, than I had with other theoretical issues to actually try to figure out if there was a contribution that a philosopher could make in forums like the UN Framework Convention in places where I'm, I'm employed also in addition to at Mason now the Center for American Progress um, which some of you may know is the, the largest liberal think tank in DC. It, is, it was founded intentionally as a counterpoint to the Heritage Foundation um, uh, and um, our president, John Podesta, is now in charge of the transition team for Barack Obama. And so uh, I'm soon going to, I'm sure, lose about half of my colleagues from the center uh, to the new administration, and then we'll have access, uh, hopefully, uh, to the policies of the new administration on energy and the environment. So is there something that I can be doing in the context of that kind of forum which would be receptive and actually help to actively make a difference. So I'm really thinking about this in terms of the front line. So the after Bali, and Bali was the first international meeting that I went to personally to sort of try out my legs, as it were, in this kind of forum. That's also what the reflections you're about to see are the ones that I personally have after that experience. So 
Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of, this is three parts. I'm going to first talk about clinical bioethics, and you'll sort of figure this out as I get into, into the talk, um, which I, I think to be the most successful area of applied ethics in terms of actually making an impact on policy and advocacy and areas like that. The only other philosopher who is at the Center for American Progress is Jonathan Marino, a very talented bioethicist who used to be uh, just down the road at University of Virginia, is now split between CAP and um, University of Pennsylvania, um, and, and most likely will play a very significant role in terms of science policy in the next administration. Um, and I want to take some lessons from the development of that field and then see if we can bring them forward through to creating a kind of a platform for doing, I think, ethics in a much more politically active way, uh, at least one a possibility for that. I'll go from there to, to describe the current state of the literature on climate ethics, so the ethics of climate change, which I think is actually uh, much better than a lot of traditional areas of environmental ethics in terms of creating philosophically rigorous arguments and uh, potentially influencing the policy discussion on that. Um, I will provide some criticisms of that literature and then move into a, the, the advancement of a clinical notion of climate ethics, so a kind of climate ethics that's based on, I think, the virtues that we saw with the development of bioethics. Now, there is an appendix. I don't know if I'll get to it. Um, it's the question that I get, depending on who's in the audience, ever since I started talking this way, is it really philosophy? Um, some of you will be very interested in this issue. Some of you will not. And so, depending on where we are in time, I may or may not wait for the discussion to bring that out or not. So uh, there you go. So the background questions, this is a, my big background question for thinking about, um, uh, thinking about these issues is why we do applied or practical ethics. You know, why do we do it? And I think this is a sort of, there's, this comes up in different discussions um, of applied ethics over the years. Um, the, I think that there are four core reasons why we do applied ethics. Um, I don't think that in all cases, and we talked about this in the context of nanotechnology, there really are unique philosophical questions that are new and novel and we've never thought of at, in the applied realm. Sometimes there are. But oftentimes I think it is the question of whether or not we can make philosophy relevant to broader discussions, right? The time scale in which we think about resolving, if we really ever do, philosophical problems is in, you know, it's millennial. It's thousands of years of discussion, right? Um, with the exception of sort of pointing out fallacies and obvious sort of dead ends. Uh, but in terms of really making contributions to ongoing questions of policy, often we're talking about, as I'll talk about later in climate change, we're talking about a time frame of, you know, uh, a decade or less. And so if philosophers and professionally trained ethicists and those of you who will not be professionally trained ethicists but are interested in the moral dimensions of these problems want to make a contribution to the discussion of these issues, we really have to think about the mode in which we're going to sort of operate. It can't really be on the model of the, the traditional uh, time frame in which we think about philosophical reflection. So here's the four areas. One of is the obvious one, contribute to a philosophical literature primarily of interest to other philosophers and students. This is the stuff that fills the journals. Um, it's important work out there. It's the stuff that we read in classes like the environmental ethics class that I was, I was talking and speaking earlier today. Secondly, um, and I'm, I'm sort of thinking about what all the different varieties, you know, medical ethics, engineering ethics, business ethics, environmental ethics, all the different varieties out there, what do they seem to have in common? At least parts of them assist other professions in understanding their moral problems and, and even really seeing the moral problems they don't recognize as moral problems. That's something that philosophers are good at doing and hopefully contribute to some resolution there. Um, third, assisting policy advocates and decision makers. So this would be policymakers, this would be people who work for nonprofits, activists of different varieties to address moral problems in some specific realm of moral concern. And finally, improve and influence the public understanding and discussion of moral issues concerning current affairs. And I think this is something that we really desperately need more philosophers and philosophically oriented and interested people to do, um, is to try to influence these public discussions where we use the language of morality and the language of value-laden terms, um, you know, uh, liberty, patriotism, all this kind of stuff, with very little reflection on what they actually mean. Um, and we can do comparative studies, I think, of where there are countries where, by dint of their geography or history, there is more of an active, open discussion, an interesting discussion in the moral uh, terms of these things in, in different ways, versus our country where, for quite a long time, I would say since the heyday of pragmatism in the U.S., in the early part of the 20th century, we really haven't seen as much of that as we could. 
Um, so that's the background question, is that it would be good if we could, I think, not only good, but in some areas, I think critical and maybe more morally responsible, be able to contribute to some of these other uh, 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 audiences other than just simply ourselves, other philosophers, and, and our students. Clinical bioethics is the field that I think has most demonstrably um, shown that this can actually be done. Um, now, bioethics, most of you will know, uh, is just generally the field of applied ethics, which focuses on ethical issues in medicine, um, the life sciences, human health and well-being, and it runs the gamut from traditional questions about, you know, uh, doctor-patient relationships all the way to new technological issues, stem cell research, you know, you know, metaphysical questions about when does life begin and what are the implications of that, and all of the abundant realms in which this is important. To keep this in mind in terms of how critically important, this is not just a question of do we evolve into a sort of a, a system of health care in this country, which really covers everyone. It is how do we spend the billions of dollars that we spend every year on medical research, which outweighs, for example, what we do on energy research by an order of magnitude. So really intrinsic to those, we have uh, these, these important questions of, of, um, of philosophy and ethics. And for various reasons, some of them I think laudable, some of them a little shaky, um, meta uh, bioethics or, or ethics really is I think fully integrated into the medical professions. Uh, and if you have any doubt that it will continue to hold a place there, just, you know, just remember for a second that our, our new chief of staff in the White House, Rahm Emanuel's older brother, uh, uh, Zeke Emanuel, is a medical ethicist at, and head of bioethics at, at NIH. So I think that it will continue to have a very important role in the political process in the U.S. There's a subfield of sorts. It might be, not be fair to call it a subfield of bioethics that has evolved, and it's clinical bioethics. So it's not just the folks who are there writing the interesting articles about stem cells, about reproductive technologies in the journals, or even necessarily the people who are giving testimony uh, on Capitol Hill or in the media on issues like this, um, but also the folks that are there in the hospital room with you when you have to make a decision about, which a decision that many of us will have to make, about what to do in a critical life or death situation with a loved one. Now, um, because of the phenomenon that all teaching hospitals and most major regional hospitals now have on staff either a, you know, a philosopher, a professional philosopher who is a, bio, a clinical bioethicist or a, a doctor with serious uh, philosophical training doing this kind of work, um, um, uh, means that, in fact, this is probably, I think, the, the, the biggest area of, of employment for philosophers at the moment. So I just finished a, a stint as the head of my professions, uh, the American Philosophical Association's Committee on uh, Career Opportunities and Placement, and I would give these workshops, you know, all the time with graduate students, and they all want to know what are, the, what, what, what are people hiring in, because as we know, along with other areas of the humanities, you know, philosophy has had a, a big problem, right, employing the many talented people that we've been producing in PhD programs. And my answer was always the same. If you don't care what area of philosophy you're working on, you just don't care at all, you could work on anything and be completely happy, go into bioethics. Because at a certain point in the last few years, there were more jobs in bioethics than there were actively good candidates on the market looking uh, for work. And now most, most, many of these jobs were not in philosophy departments at all. They were in departments of medical ethics in medical schools. They were, you know, clinical positions where people were going around doing rounds. And what these, the job basically, one of, one of the ways in which this job is done is you've got to make a decision about uh, ending life support uh, in, in the event of brain death or something tragic like this um, for a loved one and the law does not require you to do anything, right? Um, and you've got to make a decision and the decision hopefully will be the best decision that can be made in such a critical uh, uh, forum. Um, medical ethicists have disagreements but also have, have, have a lot of overlap no matter what philosophical orientation they come from in terms of what are the boundaries of what we think are, you know, a dignified death, um, a dignified life. And so the role of these people is really to figure out what's important to you, what are the values that you hold dear, what's important, what do you think the values are of this person, and then looking, taking a sober look at where they are now and what the chances are uh, that they might, you know, uh, 
revive uh, and, then, and then work through and come to the best, most morally responsible decision. Now, there's a lot of other stuff that clinical bioethicists do, but minimally, I want you to just keep that picture in your head of the, the philosopher actively with you there in the hospital room, helping you to make an extremely difficult decision. The factors that encourage this form more, more clinical form of bioethics, how it's done, and, and why it's not just simply a top-down, you know, I've got a philosophical framework, and I'm going to use this framework to work through some particular area of inquiry with doctor-patient relationship, autonomy, questions, uh, malfeasance, or some area of medical technology, is the context. Why is it done, right? The necessity to respond to something right there, right now, even if you don't have a decision that you're settled on, that you're sure about, but a decision must be made. Um, when it's done, you know, at this critical moment uh, for, for, for uh, the person uh, that you're making a decision for and, um, and for you. Um, it's done in a public setting. It's not done in a philosophical armchair. Uh, it's done by philosophers and non-philosophers alike, often in consultation, because ethics committees at hospitals are never solely composed or comprised of any one particular discipline. And it's usually in response to some kind of opportunity to engage in an individual problem and questions of public policy. Now, there's a lot to say about this, but I just want to quote my um, colleague, Jonathan Marino, who I think has done some of the most interesting reflection on this from both being an academic philosopher and doing grand rounds at hospitals and, and, and doing a lot of clinical uh, advisory work about what you can imagine is the difference in how you do this. The views that cash out of medical practice do so influenced as much by the problems at hand as by any prior theoretical views that participants bring to the table. In other words, it is rare to hear an ethics committee member in a laboratory or hospital setting explicitly appeal to the problem of balancing autonomy and beneficence, a common sort of issue in the medical ethics literature. Rather, the facts of the case, the medical uncertainty, the suffering involved, its human importance, the legal and administrative complexities, and other more immediate factors tend to overwhelm theory. Put bluntly, those who leave the seminar room for the hospital conference room will drastically change their professional role or soon find themselves unwelcome or ineffective in the latter setting. And I think this is a, a, a great gem, right, of, of distilling a lot of, a lot of Jonathan's experience on this. Um, and the question is, again, not just doing the best philosophical work or eth ethically responsible work you can do, but also keeping a role, keeping a place at the table, right, where these things are being discussed, where issues are being discussed that we all know deep down, of course, are moral issues. But there's hand-waving, irresponsible ways that one can talk about moral issues, and then there are these more engaged ways, and, and we might have to make sure that we maintain a place at that table. So the assertion I'll just make coming from this is that from this perspective of influencing policy advocates, decision makers, all those people I talked about before, that I think that a robust applied ethics of any field ought to at least include work that looks like that, certainly not be distilled only to it, then I think that bioethics is an interesting model and clinical bioethics in general for thinking about how this is to be done. And if we're going to duplicate that success, I think we need to sort of think about those examples, which I'll come back to. Okay, so let's talk about the current state of, of climate ethics, of ethics on climate change. Now, um, we, we are best understand a, a contemporary work on climate change by professional philosophers and by political theorists and uh, uh, historians and others who are sort of have it, looking at the moral dimensions of this issue um, by comparing it, I don't want to belabor this, but comparing it to the way that environmental ethics in, gen in general evolved as a discipline. If this was a talk on environmental ethics, so I would just, what's going to be effectively this one slide would be, you know, 50 minutes of discussion. But basically, um, my, my, my assertion, which I will not defend unless you ask me to later, is that traditional environmental ethics, which really arises in the early 70s uh, in various parts of the world, Northern Europe, kind of Australia, and the U.S. simultaneously born at the, you know, at the same time in those three places, um, has had the following features which are extremely problematic. Um, first of all, it's focused on the notion of developing a non-human-centered notion of the value of nature, usually talking about the intrinsic as opposed to the instrumental value of nature. What is the value of nature in and of itself, absent any consideration of why humans value it? Secondly, it's tended to be holistic. So it's focused not on individual human welfare, not on individual animal welfare, 
but actually tried to focus on the value of collective entities like species, like ecosystems, and then talk about what's the value of those things in and of themselves. What is the valley of the Shen what is the valley? What is the value of the Shenandoah Valley? There we go. Uh, in and of itself, right? Just by itself, and then how can we sort of articulate this in some way to defend its preservation rather than its development? It has tended to try to basically break from the traditions of ethics the thousands of years of history of traditions of ethics, which are quite valuable. Um, so rejecting, at first, traditional utilitarian approaches to value theory and then you know, deontological or Kantian approaches to value theory, mixed relationship with virtue theory, if you know this literature, and really tried to say we need a whole brand new way of talking about, about uh, moral value because the kind of thing we're talking about here, putting a value on, say, a species, which as in and of itself doesn't have interests, or an ecosystem, which doesn't have interests, we really don't have any adequate models in the history of philosophy that deal with how you value things like that and make a tri attribution of that kind of value. And if you buy my book, which is unfortunately overpriced, and I'm sorry about that, but I can give you a link to a, a, a flyer that will get you a discount. Um, uh, you know, uh, my colleagues, John O'Neill and Alan Holland and I basically um, you know, essentially try to eviscerate this, this, this approach uh, in a very nice kind of way to our friends who do this work and, and, are, and make arguments that it's philosophically quite problematic as with any brand new area of value theory, it's really got a lot, a lot, a lot of growing to do before it can really be, I think, uh, have good philosophical legs. But more importantly for the purposes of this talk, practically unhelpful. And one of the reasons it's practically unhelpful is because it's pr premised on a notion that if we just articulate the value of nature in and of itself, it will be like a trump card, right? It will be something that we bring into discussions where we're trying to decide about a development project and just simply say that, look, it doesn't matter whatever you want to say about the economic value here. It doesn't matter about the, what human communities want to make claim in terms of not only just resources, but the history of their habitation of a place that we have come up with a way of chunking and sorting, as my friend Brian Norton puts it, the things that have intrinsic value that ought to be respected, the things that don't and then move on from there. And this is a non-starter when it comes to the question of how we think about these complicated issues of environmental policy, right? How do we balance all the competing resource demands we have, human health, the environment, everything included, and, uh, and move forward in some kind of sustainable uh, way? Um, so various reasons we think it's kind of practically unhelpful, even if you wanted to keep on with that discussion. Now, if we look at climate ethics, we see a very different picture in a very good way, I think. And I won't go through all this, all this, but just what I've listed here are some of the names of some of the folks working in environmental ethics today um, who have been working on the question of climate change in particular and not the other sorts of areas that have really dominated the discussion of environmental, the traditional approach to environmental ethics, which by and large have been issues of wilderness preservation, uh, for example, because if you think that nature has value in and of itself, where, is that, where are you going to find that value? Well, in the wilderness areas, right? That's where it is going to be located geographically, the places where humans haven't screwed things up yet. So what's interesting about all of these different kinds of arguments, um, and if you're interested in a, in, a, in, a, in a bibliography on this, I'll be happy to share it with you, um, is that largely all of these figures, Henry Hsu, Dale Jameson, Clark Wolf, um, Tim Hayward, Simon Caney, Steve Gardner, um, former colleague of mine at the University of Washington and Angie's current colleague, um, is that none of these folks are doing the sort of, you gotta create a whole new branch of ethics and then move forward from there. They really are working from more traditional philosophical models. And so philosophically, I think, I, I would argue, if we went to talk about particulars here, their, their work has a lot more solid grounding than a lot of the work that traditionally we've seen in environmental ethics. Um, the second thing is, I don't think that this work is naive about this whole question of balancing human interests versus environmental interests as if you can just easily sort of separate the two. Um, uh, because all of them are dealing with this problem, you know, the whole climate, which you can't imagine, the entire, you know, you know the, the globe, really, where you can't imagine any way of fairly moving forward with some kind of solution to the big problems we have. Do we adopt a carbon tax or a cap and trade? You know, how do we allocate um, uh, carbon credits when we get around to doing that? What kind of um, thresholds do we set in terms of setting limits on CO2 production? How will we, you know, fairly trade uh, 
the sources of a new non-carbon-based energy. These kinds of questions of fundamental justice clearly involve uh, human value. So my initial claim, and I want to come back to this in a second, is that the moral framework that most climate ethicists is using, in fact, is more relevant to climate policy because it's already working with, within the bounds, for example, of a language which can be used to directly make an argument with, say, economists on these questions about the value of nature and the value of, say, the, the uh, uh, um, different utilization spaces we have for how we, how we use uh, the environment around, around us uh, in ways that really are much more comparable. So philosophers are making active uh, contributions to the question of, for example, discount rates. So in terms of when we think about why we act on climate change, we act in part to prevent harm to future human generations. But do we, do we assume that, you know, that they are going to be, do we sort of discount the value, the harm that we're going to put forward to them at exactly the same way we would sort of think about some kind of disvalue now, or do we decrease that because they will be growing economically in the future? These kinds of things which actually turn out to be critical in, in coming up with a fair scheme of um, distributive justice for, for climate change. Um, philosophers have a lot to say directly on that. Let me just give you one example, because I think there's some limitations to this strategy. I think it has to be continued. This work must be continued. But there is room here for something like a clinical model of ethics in this way of doing it, this, this form of ethics as well as we saw in bioethics. So one of um, Steve Gardner's, I think, best most cited and most interesting articles um, um, is called A Perfect Moral Storm, Climate Change, Intergenerational Justice, and the Problem of Moral Corruption. There's a lots of interesting stuff in this article. I just want to pull out two key themes in it that are very more important. The first thesis, he says, is it will be difficult to address global warming because of the spatial dimensions of the problem, right? Because we're talking about a substance which um, is, it's not like point source pollution. It's not like thinking about, you know, you know, some kind of hazardous arsenic or something coming out of a water pipe somewhere because of some polluting firm, and then the harm that does directly there. We're talking about something that is much more complex. The carbon that we emit goes into the, into the atmosphere. It causes problems in exactly the same way as carbon emitted anywhere else. And so we, we have a much more complex sort of situation. Because of that, you get a fragmentation of agency. You know, you can't really, really point to one form, firm or even one person. You can make arguments aggregately about, say, whether or not a country is producing disproportionately more carbon pollution than some other country. Um, but because of the dispersal of it, we don't have the same mo models of causal responsibility that we normally would. And this makes all kinds of philosophical problems like um, uh, uh, problems involving collective action problems. You know, we all get up in the morning, we get in our cars, we drive our kids. I ha don't do it yet, but at some point, I suppose I'll be driving some kid, you know, uh, you know, to daycare or wh whatever. Hopefully, we'll walk or take the metro. But you know, just imagine, and and um, and and I do it, and I get. There's a social good that's produced out of this, obviously, you know, um, um, and and everyone else does it, and of course, we want to sort of get there in the most safe and secure way. And we think we're sort of maximizing, right, uh, uh, value, and we're maximizing benefit for ourselves and for our children. But of course, collectively, when we all do this, we're producing this harm. And we don't realize that the harm, in fact, is diminishing uh, 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 our welfare. Um, and so because of the spatial fragmentation, the simple answers of we all just got to conserve, we all just got to change our light bulbs. I don't, did, did anyone catch Barack Obama's kind of off-the-cuff moment when he talks about the last debate? And the moderator sort of saying, don't you sort of see this? This is brilliant. The moderator sort of saying, what have you done personally to, you know, decrease your carbon footprint? And, and he says in this interview what he was thinking was, you know, Brian, it's not about me effing changing the light bulbs in my house. That's not how we get to a solution of climate change, right? And I was like, yeah, right. So, but, you know, he's right. Absolutely he's right. We're not going to get there through personal acts of sacrifice. But yet there is this pull to imagine in a traditional model of responsibility, it's something like that. Secondly, the problem is temporally uh, uh, dispersed. Um, it's not just about what we emit. It's what's going to happen in the future. It's about what happens in the past. And we don't have, again, as Steve says with the first thesis, we don't have institutions that really deal effectively with accumulated harm that will be passed on to future generations or with coming up with a balanced way of addressing a problem 
which was disproportionately caused by part of the world, which is now benefiting from it, right? You know, the carbon that we emitted from the 19th century onward is the carbon that's causing the problem now. And if we're going to sort of get a global cap on, this, on these emissions, then we may be disproportionately harming the economic development of, of lesser developed country, countries. And this is magnified because of globalization and colonialism and all these kinds of things. Now, what you get from this is you get a fundamental thesis which is extremely depressing, right? Um, because it looks, it really does give you a kind of how in the world are we ever going to sort of work our way out of this. So the general conclusion is that the spatial and, and, and temporal dimensions of global warming will make it harder for us to address our moral responsibilities. There aren't clear causal lines spatially. Uh, there isn't uh, clear ways of thinking about the temporal uh, dimensions of this. And this will just encourage us, in fact, to take the easy way out, right? to ignore um, the really hard moral problems that we have to take in terms of getting to this. So a quote from, again, to some solution, a quote from uh, Steve's uh, conclusion. Um, what this opens the door to, all these complexities. There is scientific uncertainty about the precise magnitude and distribution of effects of climate change. Not that it's happening, not that it's anthropogenic. That's not what he's talking about. There is no uncertainty about that. Uh, but there's uncertainty about what areas are going to be impacted in what way in the short term, right? especially in the short term. So we don't know, for example, whether or not this just means, hey, great, there will be better wine in Ontario, Canada, you know, and, you know, tastier apples, I don't know, somewhere else, right? Um, um, we don't know some of these. Um, and, and partly it's like we don't yet have, we have good climate models for the global impacts. We don't have very good regional climate models yet uh, for a lot of these things. So some nations wonder, he says, we might be better off with climate change than without it. More importantly, some countries might wonder whether they will at least be relatively better off than other countries. And this will then encourage people not to, in fact, participate in some of the international uh, agreements that have to take place in order to resolve this problem. And then the article stops. And then you just kind of want to go, well, okay, screw it. I'm just going to go do work on, I'm going to go do, you know, modal logic. You know, just like, you know, something safer. At the end of the day, I know whether I got it right or wrong. You know, it's like, hey, forget it, right? So the challenge I want to sort of, I want to say, and I do think Steve realizes this, to be fair to him. Um, if something like these arguments of regional uncertainty and all the complexities that he points out in his, in his piece um, are being uh, used now to determine policy outcomes or influence public opinion, and in fact they certainly have been used to manipulate public opinion uh, 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 um, to, to a great extent, I, I want to know wh why do we ex accept this as a conclusion, right? Why do we accept this as the unfortunate outcome? Um, rather, we have to, I think, first of all, immediately come up with the kinds of answers right away that should call this kind of conclusion into question. And then second, in which I don't think are very complicated uh, arguments. And then secondly, move forward, like I said, to developing a broader way of doing ethics that can uh, deal with this kind of um, environment. Such as, how would you immediately respond to, you know, there are winners and losers in climate change. And this is like one of those become one of my mantras, you know. You know, wh when I went to Bali, I said like, damn it, I'm going to take on this winners and losers crap because it's just wrong and it's offensive. Argument number one is there just is amazing uncertainty about what the future holds because we really don't, we really are literally entering into uncharted territory here. This is a pretty strange graph for a climate change talk. Um, and it was put together uh, uh, by a friend of mine, Jeff Keel, at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, which is one of the top climate modeling outfits in the country. Now what we have here is we have global mean temperatures starting here zero where we are now going back millions and millions of years. So in fact, it looks like things are getting cooler. That's great. And in fact, they did. Things used to be a lot hotter. And then what we have is we have the different kinds of scenarios that have been generated. There's a maximum estimate scenario, which is the purple over on the right hand, on your right hand side. And then there are the, dish, the different IPCC scenarios, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, right, which is the international body, which has been essentially producing the best science uh, on this topic, and you look at their different scenarios and where we're going back, where we're possibly going back to a, given a kind of a business as usual scenario, given a scenario where the U.S. and other major emitters do not join together and try to make the ambitious cuts that need to be made in order to, say, avoiding a three degree 
uh, centigrade rise in, in global annual temperatures into the future, which we are seriously threatened in, in, in doing if you, if you uh, look at the, 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 the global uh, climate models. And in each way, you sort of just take that, that, that middle scenario, we're going back to, you know, a, 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 an environment that we had 20 million years ago. This was not a friendly environment for our species and lots of the other species that we share the planet with. What this is going to mean regionally and globally, um, we have no idea, but it's a pretty good uh, precautionary tale for not taking the whole, oh, well, we might be okay, especially if you're worried about the welfare of future generations, even narrowly the welfare of only the future generations that, you know, currently will emanate from our, our country. Secondly, the whole idea that there are, that this is a global problem that we know is causing global harm right now, forget thinking about the future, but thinking about the extreme weather events we have very good reason to believe are being exacerbated by climate change, all the stuff that's happening right now, um, to say that, oh, well, they're, they're just winners and losers. Some people just happen to live, you know, uh, in Bangladesh, you know, in a delta where they may be submerged pretty soon and, you know, people at the tops of mountains, they'll be fine and don't worry you know, because of the different ways in which impacts are going to be distributed, is like saying this is a game where there is a, some fair way of figuring out winners and losers. And it's not a game in that way. The analogy, I think, is to say that there are winners and losers in global climate change would be like saying there are winners and losers in the global trade in human organs, right? So if we just said, oh, it's fine, you know, other countries are going to suffer but, you know, we'll be okay, sort of like saying, well, you know, too bad there are poor people uh, in Pakistan who are willing to sell their organs. If you can get a good kidney now in Pakistan for about $10,000, according to my friends who study this issue, and don't worry about what you put in your own body because you can always buy a kidney somewhere else, and they're just too unfortunate that they are actually, their back is against the wall, and this is the only way that they can afford to make money to feed themselves for the next, the next year, is, of course, morally repugnant. And I think that kind of frontline argument is a way of thinking, let's not conclude with the assumption, right, with the, with the justification for uh, uh, these kinds of conclusions, but really think about how we can get beyond them. This causes me to revisit this initial claim about climate ethics, the initial one that I made about what I think are the virtues of it, right, where recall I said the moral framework of most climate ethics is more relevant to climate policy. I think that's absolutely true. I would stand by that. Um, it's not outside the boundaries of the public discussion of this problem the way traditional environmental ethics is. But I would say that in my experience with the people at the center of this policy debate, none of them would ever deny this is a morally complex problem, um, and none of them would ever deny the difficulty in addition to, to addressing this because we do not have, we've never tried to solve a problem like this in human history. We make a lot of analogies about you know, this is like the calling of our collective generations is like, you know, taking on fascism in World War II, you know, uh, taking on, on the history of slavery, but it, it really isn't. It's much more it's going to be much more difficult, but also in that way, a, a challenge which I think we can, we can rise to. So it, in some of the places, I, I'm not, again, not arguing we shouldn't be doing this kind of philosophical work, but some of the details of some of the problems, and I'm happy to talk about this later, specific examples I have in mind, um, of the philosophical machinations of this are not the only thing we need philosophers and trained ethicists to be contributing to the discussion, but more also something like, you know, that model of, of clinical climate, of clinical bioethics. We need some kind of literature and ways of intervening in these um, forums, which is providing the arguments that the policy advocates, the policymakers who are looking at this seriously and are not, frankly, ideological hacks are really arguments and the data and the research they're going to need to actually work through the resolution of this problem uh, in ways that, that really satisfy our moral intuitions about how that resolution should look. Now, I, I've said before, it's, it's, we, we don't have time anymore. Our, we are, I do believe that our backs are against the wall. This is also a post-Bali post issue. And it is akin to that there is a patient in the hospital room and we need to attend to them right now. That's where we are, and this became abundantly clear in the, in the response of, I think, some of the most important um, scientific voices on climate change just prior to and just after the Bali meeting, where I believe the collective, you know, after the fourth uh, IPCC assessment, right, and after the continued efforts of the Bush administration 
at the Bali meeting to try to completely derail it. And I'm happy to talk about how that happened later. Um, I think people just said, enough. Um, scientists, of course, uh, are, their, their role is not to come up with policy outcomes for problems like this. Their, the role that they play is to produce the data, to, to produce the research, to produce the science, which is going to help us to make better decisions. But I think they had finally become completely sick of this. Uh, and just two things that I think were quite remarkable that were said, one, one before and right after. We'll start on the bottom, actually. This is Rachendra Pachuri, who is the, the head of the IPCC. Um, just wrote in the ramp up to the Bali meeting, said in, in, op, said in, in, a, in, in an, um, an op-ed that was uh, published in the New York Times, what we do in the next two or three years will define our future. That doesn't mean solve the problem in the next two or three years. That means if we don't get seriously down the road to solving this problem, if we don't make the next steps towards a U.S. say cap and trade program, which I think we have to do, not the first hundred days, but certainly you know, the first, the, the first, the first year, minimally, uh, in the Obama administration, something has to happen. And the, the ethics part of that has to happen a pace with it. Jim Hansen, and this, think about the graph that I showed you that my friend from NCOR had produced, said just after the Bali meetings, we need to reduce from today's atmospheric CO2 about 385 parts per million to 350. We are, quote, already too high to maintain the climate to which humanity wildlife and the rest of the biosphere are adapted, this target must be pursued on a time scale of decades. So I think if we are going to make a contribution to that conversation in the time scale of decades, we have to figure out the most effective way of making that contribution. And in just in case you sort of wondered, and this is from some polling that I did um, with, some, with some colleagues, one at Yale and one at George Mason, just prior to the last election, which shocked the hell out of us, I must tell you. Um, and I'll explain what this project is part of when I get to the very end of my talk. Um, it looked, it, 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 in terms of undecided voters in America, uh, in the couple of weeks going up to to, uh, to the last election, you know, all five of those undecided voters in the country, I suppose, right? But if you look at seriously the number of undecided voters, it turned out that, you know, climate change was not the most important, single most. There was no, there weren't, there were very few single issue voters out there. But in people deciding Obama versus McCain, it was in the top three. It was in a cluster. And there's been a lot of recent polling, some of which just came out today in a poll released by the Environmental Defense that shows that uh, over 50% of Americans actually are strongly in favor of a green jobs bill, of the next stimulus package being a green stimulus package, not only because they think this would be better for the economy, but also because they think it, you get that, 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 that uh, mutual reward of also beginning to work on climate change. Um, so clinical climate ethics, and, and the, this last bit here, uh, I, I, don't, I hate, if anyone's got a better image for this, please send it to me. I kind of, you know, it sort of says what I want to say, but it's also icky, so forgive me. Um, uh, so let's put it somewhere else. Okay, so the, um, this last part will go pretty quickly. I want to just roll out what I think is the kind of, the, what might be another, a new kind of maybe novel uh, in some respects, but not completely novel, a philosophical intervention um, on what we need. And again, what I want is a counterpart to what that bioethicist, that clinical bioethicist is doing with you in that hospital room when you're making this life and death decision. So with two colleagues, Ed Maybach at the uh, George Mason Center for Climate Change Communication and Tony Leischerwitz, uh, who runs the Yale Forestry School project on climate change, um, we are proposing uh, a pretty ambitious platform to basically run a, a five-year experiment and be able to deliver data every single month on public attitudes on climate change. Not just like how people are doing and whether they're, you know, putting in, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, new light bulbs in their houses, but what do they think of the politics, what they're going to think of the next major cap and trade bill that hits the House floor, when the Senate starts debating whether or not we should sign the Copenhagen Agreement, like all along the way, right? And also test arguments about, about, about different things that can appeal to different people. This is a platform we've, we've been working on. And the assumption of this platform um, is very similar to an assumption that you find in George Lakoff's work, if some of you know him, on sort of, sort of values orientations of voters. So this is mostly work that was done originally by, by, by Tony Leischowitz at Yale who took that sort of framework, you basically divide 
you know, the electorate up to, in, in terms of value uh, choices, it's very crude, egalitarians, hierarchicalists, you know, a few others. Um, and it turned out that the, the strongest correlate on public attitudes about climate change um, was not political affiliation, political party, was not race, gender, you know, uh, uh, income, none of that stuff. The strongest correlate to what people were going to say on what we are going to call, we, we call the different, the three moral gaps involving public decision making on climate change was moral framework. So if you had some other independent way of sort of figuring out what people thought about, you know, should you, you know, you know, uh, to, to, to take a cue from the last election, you know, share resources around and try to do things fair or, you know, only, you know, keep your toys to yourself. You know, different ways we had of getting to people's attitudes on that, there was this really very strong correlation. And on most of these gaps, strong improvement in just the last two or three years. So when people say the American public isn't ready for this, and there are folks, for example, at the Pew uh, Center for Climate Change uh, who've done a lot of really interesting polling on climate, um, who've consistently said, well, you know, it never shows up as a top priority in voter preferences, so it's just not, an, it's not a starter yet with the American public. We have really good reason to believe that's wrong. So the three moral gaps that this, that this, the, the project that we're building out of this research has been the urgency gap, a need to act now, a temporal gap, when will things go wrong, and a spatial gap, who will it happen to? which really are going to be extremely strong indicators for how important and how quickly we can move on this problem and then meet the challenges that Jim Hansen and Richenda Pichori has sort of put in front of us. So the urgency gap. Now, th this was taken originally from a study that Tony did of watchers of an inconvenient truth. So, so, the, so, so just ignore the extremely um, uh, hopeful looking blue bars uh, on these slides because these are people who went in, saw an inconvenient truth, and were convinced, were strongly convinced that this is something um, that we have to do something about right now. So the question there, life on Earth will continue without major disruptions only if we take immediate and drastic action to reduce global warming. Um, and you see uh, uh, um, um, the, the, in 2006, about 20% you know, saying, saying uh, um, now in terms of the urgency gap, 19% saying in 10 years. Same question asked just one year later, you saw a 10% jump in people sort of saying we had to act now. And this is extremely encouraging, you know, when we look at this. Second gap, temporal gap. When do you think global warming will start to have dangerous impacts on people around the world? 20% say now, 19% say in 10 years uh, in 2006. Again, 2007, a 10% gap in one year of people saying this is an urgent problem. Now, why is this the case? What's happening uh, between 2006 and, 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 and 2000, well, really 2000, 2005 and 2007? The lowest point, the low point is actually 2004. The low point in all of this, anything remotely resembling this kind of study, is right when Bush won um, the, uh, his, his re-election. Uh, and then things start getting better. And what happens in this time? A lot of stuff happens. And it's not one single factor. Katrina happens, for one thing. Uh, polar bears happen, become the poster child for, and this really does resonate with a lot of people. Um, uh, inconvenient truth comes out, you know, lots of sort of other sort of markers on the map. But basically you, so you begin to see this ebbing of the high water mark of kind of, I think I would want to argue, is I, was largely ideologically manipulated climate skepticism and the impact that that had on the American elector electorate. The problem that we still have though is a spatial gap. So when you survey people about who is this going to affect, they say, well, plants and animals first, you know, and then people in other countries, and then way down there, you know, at 18%, it's going to be um, your local community that's going, to, that's going to be affected by this. And this can be, you can think of lots of reasons why this, would be, this is a problem. And one of them is the question we just looked at in the Gardner article, because it really is amenable to that, you know, there are winners and losers. So unfortunately, there are losers, and so this might just be an act of charity that we would do something on climate change. It's, not, it's either going to benefit us or it really won't impact us uh, uh, um, in, in, any, um, uh, in any bad way anytime soon. Um, but I think it, that's the kind of data that points you to the kind of argument that needs to be made, right? It gives you an idea of the frontier of where we need to make certain kinds of moral arguments. And what I would want to argue, and these are my conclusions, 
is that this puts us in, this is the kind of information that puts us on something like, you know, right, in, in uh, something, uh, something akin to that bioethicist in the hospital room with you. Because now, of course, it's not the clinical climate ethicist in a hospital room with one person, it's with a lot of people. And it's wanting to know what a lot of people value and what a lot of people hold dear and what a lot of people think morally motivates them, say, obligations to future generations or concern about endangered species um, versus the stuff that really won't be effective. And given the time frame in which we need to come out with, I think the biggest toolbox of arguments that motivate the broadest uh, consensus of people um, to work on this issue, this is, the kind of, this is the kind of work that we need to do. It is, provides also a platform. And this is the point here at the bottom that Tony sort of made in one of his original arguments um, in 2006, the kind of platform that is going to give us the tools we need to be able to talk to people which have rad which, who have radically different uh, kinds of attitudes about not only the state of the science and the worries about it, but really uh, what is the moral motivation, what is the moral reason to do that. Now, I'm not saying this is exhaustive of what a cl clinical approach to climate ethics would look like, but I think this is the kind of tool and the one that I sort of personally signed on uh, to work on to do this. The, the project that we're building out of this, just quickly and then we'll stop, looks like this. Um, we've set up a, a platform, which is web-based, and we've given, you know, computers to, uh, so far, it's, we just run a pilot version of it. Um, uh, 1, 1,200 families, you know, in, in different parts of the U.S. Um, what we want to work to is having a sample size of 12,000 adults and, and 3,000 teenagers, right? So 6,000 families. Um, which not only gets a baseline of what their attitudes are, and this is the pilot was the, 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 the version that we used to get those statistics I gave you before on like, you know, how climate change actually was a pretty, an issue in the last election, uh, which many people doubted would be true. Um, and then um, we, uh, we, after doing an exhaustive initial survey of what their attitudes are and all the gaps that I mentioned, a lot of other information, what they're doing in their own lives, are they changing light bulbs, do they think they need to put pressure on uh, political figures. Do they even know there's a Kyoto Protocol and that there's a successor coming up to it? All the kind of things that we need to know. Um, then along the way, at every step of the debate, we can present them with uh, different, different. Um, we can test their their understanding of how the debate has changed over time, and then begin to test the different arguments. Which say, for example, if we are getting to, uh, uh, let's say, a, a point where. Um, different people again want to ideologically manipulate the electorate on climate change, then we can come up, we can raise that as a red flag that needs to be looked at. Just one example I talked about earlier in the environmental ethics class today. We are about to embark on a national debate on what our national cap and trade system is going to look like. Most of the outfits and most of the individuals who used to be involved in the climate skepticism business, right, a lot of them are now involved in the carbon tax business. So they're sort of saying instead of a, a national cap and trade system to put a price on carbon and start decreasing our carbon emissions, instead what we need is a straight out carbon tax. Now, there are lots of reasons why I think a carbon tax is a better way to go than a cap and trade system. Um, I don't think these folks think that a carbon tax is a better way to go for, for, for is at all. What they think is, and they're exactly right, and we've got the numbers to show it, is that you, you ask people to do a tax rather than a cap and trade system and then support psh, goes south, right? And I think that's just one of the ways in which I think we'll be able to see whether that argument is how far it's getting into the electorate. Is it actually having an influence? Is it actually going to shape the debate? And then we'll be, we, we, we'll be you know, as the saying goes, forewarned so forearmed to begin making the arguments about why, you know, uh, um, that is, a, first of all, manipulation of the facts and, and probably not the fairest way to go. So I'll save the appendix for, see if that comes up later, and we'll take some questions. Thank you. Yeah, in the back. Can you speak up just a little bit? 
Great. Okay, good. No, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I really, I think that's a fine comment and, and a very good comment. Um, and I think you're right about everything you say. The, the problem, I think, is, is this, is that, is that um, it is just the carbon we emit, but it's also the carbon that gets sequestered. And so on the one hand, you've got not only the emissions, but you've also got, uh, you've also got um, what, car what CO2 gets drawn back, you know, by, mostly by biomass, by plants. And then there's there, then that lay, adds this layer of complexity right, right there, right just initially, which is how much do we count, you know, um, projects that are reforestation? Um, how do we sort of how do we sort of tax or how do we sort of not tax? No, don't use that word. Um, but how do we right? Um, uh, uh, how do we um, how do we count um, deforestation? And then whether or not we sort of think about any of this as remotely similar when we're looking at, for example. Um, counting, and this is one of the ways the U.S. has continually tried to screw up the Kyoto Accords. Do we sort of weigh, um, you know, um, um, acres of corn in the Midwest that are being grown for biofuels the same as we would look at, you know, tropical rainforests and stuff like this? So there's sort of those kinds of complexities. Another layer of spatial complexity that's not direct, you're quite right, but sort of gets added on to that is in terms of the technology to deal with this, right? Um, and, and that's not, it's not, I wouldn't say that's necessarily a spatial complexity, at least in this respect, is that um, with very few, um, with very few, ex there's a few exceptions to this, but essentially we sort of figure out a substance is hazardous to human health or hazardous to, you know, um, some other, other part of the biota, it's hazardous everywhere. Uh, and there can be like different questions of risk tolerance in different countries and sort of stuff like that, different ways of measuring harm, different models that are used to do that. Um, but um, when we're talking about carbon, we're talking about how do we get to, you know, as Al Gore wants to do, um, to a carbon neutral uh, uh, economy in 10 years, if, you, if you're looking at numbers. And we won't get there in 10 years, but like just starting from that, that possibility. It's going to make take some radical changes in the technology, and that's going to create a big problem, which, and this is a different kind of spatial problem, but how do you make sure that that technology is evenly distributed and doesn't, you know, uh, um, unduly um, uh, cause a new distributive problem, which is the poor countries getting poorer because they're having to pay for it because they've signed on to some international agreement versus the rich countries who develop, who are probably going to develop the technology getting richer. So there's these other dimensions, but I, but you're, I think you're exactly right in, in, in that. That's a fair question. And let me just preface this by saying, and I've sort of said this in the discussion of environmental, in the context of discussing environmental ethics more broadly. Um, now, a lot of bioethicists disagree with me on, on this, which is that I think that there is a, a lot, if you, if you take the full measure of the output, not just being, you know, the papers that are produced and, and are published in the best journals, such as the American Journal of Bioethics, but also include the, the on-the-ground advice that's given in those hospital rooms or at, you know, ethics committees in hospitals, you take the full measure of that and, you know, it seems to me there's as much good work being done by philosophers as by medical doctors who have some training in ethics or have some deep interest in ethics. Um, and then there are the few freaks out there who actually bother to get a PhD and an MD, you know, and they're just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in awe of them, right? So the... Um, <clears throat> 
I, so when, when I sort of say I think there's a role there, I don't think it's just for professionally trained philosophers, but for people who have um, hopefully by exposure uh, to um, professional philosophy and the tools that hopefully we can give them, which I'm not sure are all there yet, certainly they're not all there yet, <clears throat> we'll be able to sort of be the ones on the front line. So a lot of the people in the agencies that I work with now who are doing really the substantive moral work and say NOAA or the U.S. Forest Service or the Parks Department are not professionally trained philosophers. They are, they are natural resource managers who have taken a deep interest in the moral issues. So among that crowd, I'll just answer with an anecdote and then try to sharpen it up. Um, just prior to uh, September 11, 2001, um, you may or may not recall um, that we had a series of hearings in the U.S. Senate about stem cell research. And a bunch of, as, as, as the bioethicists have really been successful at doing, you know, um, when they had he he hearings on stem cell research, you had, bio you had ethicists sitting right next to the scientists, right, on these, on these committees, on these panels. So a good friend of mine, Glenn McGee, um, who's now at SUNY Albany, and at the time was at University of Pennsylvania, um, testified before Congress. And this was covered by uh, the, one of the chief New York Times correspondents in Washington, D.C., Cheryl Gay Stolberg, um, who wrote the, the front page article about the bioethicists and what they said about stem cell research. The following Sunday, in the Week in Review section, um, uh, Stolberg published a, a, an op-ed piece, um, and I can't remember exactly what it was called, but the, the operative line in it was, who are these bioethicists anyway, right? I know as much, and you didn't put it this way, you put it, you actually used the word intuitions, right? She goes, <laughs> she goes my well-meaning grandmother knows as much about ethics as any pointy-headed philosopher does, right? To which I then wrote, you know, an editorial which, of course, was never published. But I sent it to Stolberg. Um, and, 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 and she was extremely generous in writing back, and we started a kind of a correspondence about this. And I do think that, that, that look, there is something to, to the training, whether it comes directly to doing a, an advanced degree in philosophy or some other degree, and you're sort of getting some training in, in ethics and philosophy, of we have, like I said, we, we, I, we, we can point to very precious for you things we've just sort of figured out, you know, and we're certain are true, but we know a lot of crap. Right? We, I mean, what I mean by this, we know a lot of stuff that is crap, right? Um, we know a lot of things that are false. We know a lot of things that are non-starters. There is very good critical um, uh, training that you get, not only in looking at the history of mistakes that have been done in the history of philosophy and dead ends and fallacies and different things. Views get revived all the damn time, you know, things that we thought were well dead and gone. But nonetheless, um, um, there is a lot to the training which, in fact, should it be listened to in the same way that we listen to science? Not exactly, but I think with, you know, a, a similar sense of thinking about, you know, w the, 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 the moral terrain of any particular issue at hand. Now, I, this is one of the reasons why um, I have signed on to a project like this. It would help if we had some data, you know, frankly. Not just because I think there is some intrinsic advantage to having the data, but I think it, it helps us to make a better argument in the same way that data helps economists make better arguments, data helps biologists make better arguments. And we can sort of say that, look, there are a bu there's a, a big degree of overlap between people who value this and people who value that. We can sort of tie those two things together and then make arguments about consistent and inconsistent policies that we need to make with respect to resolving a question like climate change. So, we, we don't want, given that climate change is um, exacerbating, and I talked about this earlier in the class I was in, exacerbating so many other problems of public health, of social welfare, just making so many other things worse. We don't want the solutions to climate change at the national or international level to exacerbate these other social problems, given that there is this causal connection right now. And thinking about those consistencies, I think, is something that, someone who's got a philosophical frame of mind, however they got it, is, is, is someone good to have at the table. Right. <laughs>